we pray. Praise is to our God. Let the church say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Yes. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. Amen, somebody. I don't know about you, but if your heart is not full after that wonderful singing, I don't know what can or will prick your heart. God knows. I, I was sitting there listening to the singing, and I said, God knows who to give certain talents to. God knows who to bless certain people with, because if I was blessed with that kind of talent, I couldn't handle it. If I was blessed with that kind of talent, I can't, I can't guarantee I'd be singing for the Lord. So God knows who to bless who with what. And I'm just glad he blessed our brother with the talent that he has because he's praising and he's singing and he's serving our God. I don't know if I've ever met a Melton that cannot sing. Amen, somebody. I don't think I ever have. But we are just truly blessed to be here. I'm truly thankful for the invitation to be here. I'm truly uh, thankful for the offer to come. I, I spoke with Brother Skurlock a few months ago, and he said that you all were kicking off this series on dealing with family. And he asked if I would come and be a part, and I was elated to come, and I had a chance to uh, speak with your wonderful minister. Every time I have a chance to talk to Brother Glenn, it, it does me more good than it could ever do you. Uh, he is a, a wise person. He's a generous person, and most of all, he's a genuine person. I thought I'd get a better shout than that. We're talking about the angel of the house. Y'all have a good man here. I, I, I know a lot of preachers, and there are some preachers that can preach good, but they're not good men. And then you have some men that are good, but they can't. But y'all are blessed here at the Belford congregation because... Not only do you have a minister that can preach good, but he's a good man. Amen, somebody. Give it up for the man of the hour, the angel of this house. We're thankful for him. I am not going to be long. Uh, allow me just to share a few things from the Word of God. If you don't mind, we have a custom at Southside. Whenever the Word of God is read, we stand to our feet. If you don't mind, just indulge me for a second and just stand to your feet. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 30. 1 Samuel 30. The Bible says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. Y'all see that? lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahanoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons, and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. You may be seated in the very presence of our God.
Allow me just before I get into this, it was acknowledged earlier, but I want to acknowledge the, the love of my life. Uh, my beautiful wife is here. If you could, Sharana, just stand so everybody can see. Amen. I grew up in the I grew up in the 80s, and there was a um, there was a a doll that that came out in the 80s called My Buddy. Y'all don't look at me like you don't know. And and the, and the slogan behind My Buddy was, "Everywhere I go, he goes." Well, I want to say I don't have. I'm 34 years old. I ain't got no My Buddy doll, but I do have a beautiful, supportive wife. And everywhere I go. She goes, and she's with my, my baby girl is with my, my parents this morning, but we have my three older daughters, so it's just good to have them here. Also, I have a few people from Southside in the audience as well. Just good to have them here for the support as well. And it's good to see my good friend, uh, Ralph Kennel. We went, went to Southwestern Christian College together uh, back in 03, back when I had some hair and your hair was black. But time keeps on ticking. Time keeps on moving. But it's good to see you. If you will, look at someone and just tell them, I'm fighting for my family. That was the wrong neighbor. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm fighting for my family. Amen, somebody. When, when, you, read, when you read the creation story, and you look at how God created and designed the Garden of Eden. He created Adam and he built Eve and he put them in this wonderful garden. Yeah. One of the underlying implications that you see when you look at what God did with Adam and with Eve and you look at where God placed them, you discover that God has a design for a utopia community they were designed to live in utopia they were designed to live in peace the garden of eden uh, was designed to lack absolutely nothing it had everything that was needed and they needed for nothing they had a perfectly peaceful life they had everything that they needed, but life is about choices. And when the choice was made to try and be independent of God's rule by creating or rather by eating the fruit that made them independent of God's rule. And it brought about one word that we all know, sin. But another word that it brought about was drama. Someone once said, ain't no drama like family drama because family drama just don't stop. And although it is the undeniable will that we live drama-free lives, most of us, even children of God, have fallen short Regardless of where you are in life, I want you to hear this. Regardless of where you are in life, there is no substitute for good management of life relationships and priorities. Now, drama is a very colorful term that refers to emotionally charged situations that can rob us of peace and rob us of a sense of security in our lives. The dramas of life become harmful, even destructive when left unchecked in our lives. And after giving rise to negative emotions that can spin your life and turn your world upside down. It is wise to master Dealing with life's dramas in your life. It is wise to master dealing with life's dramas even in your present state. And not wait for someone to rescue you from the dramas of life that you're faced with. Now, let me give you a very 
good definition of what drama is. Drama is an emotionally stimulating episode of situational turbulence and negative stress caused by the personal interpretation of events or the interaction with life issues. That was the deepest you've ever heard drama, wasn't it? Let me give it to you one more time. Drama is emotionally stimulating episodes of situational turbulence and negative stress caused by personal interpretation of what events of the interaction with the life of other people. As long as you live, you will have to deal with drama. Drama can happen in five different categories in your life. Drama can come, number one, from distasteful incidents. That can be the drama fallout of troubling situations. Drama, secondly, can come from debilitating immaturity. That is the drama that comes in your life that's caused by your own poor judgments. Drama can come from disturbing issues. That is the drama that stems from other people's dysfunctional behavior. That's when you have to learn how to say, I will not allow you to cause me to make your situation my emergency. That was so good. Amen, somebody. And, and the fourth way drama comes about is difficult individuals. Drama that is brought about by uncaring and insensitive folk in your life. You've got to learn how to divorce yourself from their own dysfunctions so that they don't become a necessity for your peace. Listen to me very carefully. If God limited my happiness to what others could do to bring me joy, then others could hold my joy and my happiness hostage. Okay, if my happiness and my joy have to be sourced in people, then people can hold my happiness hostage and keep my joy in jail. Now, now the fifth way that drama can come about is through destructive insecurities. Drama that you create on your own based on your own unmerited paranoia. Okay, y'all are looking at me funny. You think everybody's talking about you. They look at you funny and you think that they don't like you, not knowing it's your own insecurities that's playing tricks on you. Drama is part of the human story, and it seems to be woven in the fabric of our existence. Once again, ain't no drama like family drama, because family drama just don't stop. It is ever-present emotionally painful and a horrible situation when not managed properly in the text David found himself faced with some family drama he's been out let me just set it up for you he's been out he's been out doing battle with the Philistines which was the nation that threatened to put Israel in a polytheistic or a multiple God nightmare. David has been out doing his duty. David has been out fighting the enemy in battle to keep his nation safe and his God as the only true and living God. I want you to hear the words that I'm using. I'm speaking the type of words for a reason. 
He's been out doing his duty. He's been out working. He's been out in battle. And when he gets dismissed in chapter 29 from participating in the Philistine battle, he returns to the town of Ziklag and discovers drama. He gets there and discovers that a group by the name of the Amalekites have come into his camp, taken his sons and his wives and his daughters. So then his family has been impacted and affected and disturbed. Watch this. And it happened while David has been out defending the faith. His family gets disturbed. And it happens while he's out doing his job. It happens while he's out making a living. I'll say it again. While David is out extending the faith and doing his job and making a living, the enemy sneaks in and disrupts his family. And it happens by an enemy that he did not see coming while he was in battle. His family is disturbed. His family is divided. And it's messed up by an enemy that snuck in while he was working. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had trouble slip into your family that you did not see coming? And you were not expecting. You did not see coming your child becoming promiscuous at a young age. You did not see coming your spouse having an affair on you. You did not see coming your siblings turning their backs on you. You did not see coming your child joining up inside of a game. And it all happened right under your nose while you were at work trying to make a living. And to top it all off, it happened while you were doing well. It happened while you were doing the right things. You see, if you're like David in this text, you weren't doing something you had no business doing. You weren't out doing something wrong. You were working like David to keep your family stable. Working to make sure that your family had what was needed. Working to make sure everything was taken care of. And before you knew it, some Amalekitish situation jumped into your house and disrupted your family. That boy is preaching. Financial situations, peer pressures, drugs, disgruntlement, dissatisfaction, and by the time you discovered what was going on, it was too late because it had already been taken. Now, your family is disjointed. So now you don't talk to your children because you can't handle the embarrassment of what they're doing. Ooh, y'all quiet in here. Now you're the parent, but you're ready to kick them out because you can't handle the embarrassment of what you're doing, of what they're doing. Here it is. Your parents didn't kick you out when you had struggles. Y'all not talking to me. You ready to put your child out? Can we keep it real? I keep it real. It's outside. You ready to put your child out because they smoke weed? You ready to put your child out because they got involved in drugs and you did not see it coming? You walk away from your child. Because while you were trying to keep them safe, 
the Amalekites came in and messed your child up, let me help you with this. If your parents and if my parents did not give up on us, then we have no business giving up on the children that God has blessed us with. There is no scripture that gives us permission to disown our child. Discipline them, yes, and while your child may be grown, while you may not be able to tell your child what to do anymore, you can still pray about what they're doing. Okay, let me say it like this. They may get too old to punish, but they're never too old for prayer. Talk, boy. Okay, there are some of us in here today in the midst of family drama. The Amalekites came in and stole your family from you. Haven't talked to your siblings in months. Have no conversation with your parents anymore. You and your husband are roommates, but the love is far from gone. Not even sleeping in the same room anymore. The kids don't even speak to each other anymore. But the good news this morning is, though we all experience drama, it might be divisive. It might be debilitating. It might be disheartening. And it might even be dysfunctional, but the damage does not have to be eternal. Amen. Amen. Somebody, regardless of the drama that you experience, it does not have to be eternal. Your family can recover. I thought I'd get a better shout than that. Your family can recover. The breach between you and your spouse, the breach between you and your children, the divide between you and your siblings, you can recover and make life better than it's ever been. I mean, I mean, all we really have to do, y'all, all we really have to do is read the Bible. And you will discover that the stories inside of the Word of God, the families inside of the Word of God, were not leave it to beaver accounts. They were not the Huxtables. They were more like the Evans. Y'all don't want to talk to me. They were raw and uncensored, bitter reminders of how awful family life can become. They battled for their survival. They battled for their futures. They battled for their children. And just like those families, many of our families are flawed too. Flawed by dismemberment and physical and emotional violence. Flawed by infidelity. Flawed by petty jealousy and mean spiritedness. And the Amalekites came in and took your family. Tell your neighbor today, you can get your family back. That was about 22 of y'all. Tell your neighbor, today you can get your family back. Okay, and let me say this. Let me say this. This, this is not a message exclusive for married couples. If you are single, you are your family okay be careful walking around talking about i wish i had a family we know what you mean but be careful because when you say that what you imply is i'm not complete without it okay you don't need nobody to complete you because if you need somebody to complete you that means when you were created, you were a fraction. But God made you whole when he created you, when he made you, when he built you. Nobody completes you, they complement you. 
Y'all ain't talking to me. They, they help you. They push you. They assist you. But I don't need you to make me complete. Was I just a have before you came along? Let's do it like this. All the single folks say, I am my family. This time say it like you believe it. I am my family. So the question then becomes, if I am single and I am my family, then what can the Amalekites take? They can take your joy. They can take your peace. They can take your confidence. So now you're single running from relationship to relationship trying to get somebody to tell you that you're special. This ain't for the faint of heart. Amalekites don't just steal tangible things. Amalekites can steal emotional things. So now, so now you're single and you're insecure. You're single and you have no joy. You're single and you're always discouraged. You're single and you don't know how to manage your money or a job. There are things that can be taken when you are single that can even keep you from qualifying to get married. Okay. Some single folk are gorgeous but not marriage material. Because they're focusing on the outer beauty but never focusing on the inward beauty. And to marry you, I don't need you to look perfect all day long. I need times when I can talk to you and get stimulated by conversation and pray with you. I need someone who will help me with wisdom and help me get through some things. It's, it's not just about the physical. I need somebody that will stimulate my mind and pray for me when I feel like I can't pray for myself. Yeah. Talking about I got I to gotta go to the gym every day and get this body right. You better pick up the word of God and get your mind right so you'll be eligible when the right person comes along. So, so if you're single... If you're single, you are your family. And things can be taken from you. But there is good news. Whatever the enemy has taken, God can help you get it all back. God can restore your marriage. God can restore your children. See, see the folk that have been through some stuff, ought to be the one shouting right through in here. He can restore your marriage. He can restore your children. He can restore your relationship with your parents, your relationship with your siblings. Whatever you've lost, God can restore it. Let's walk through a few principles and the lesson will be yours. Here's the first thing. Don't leave your family uncovered. Look, look at verse 1. Now it happened when David and all his men came to Ziglag. Stop right there. On the third day. Okay, stop right there. When David and all the men returned after three days to Ziglag. Stop right there. So all the men have been with David. And the Amalekites have spied out that the soldiers are not in the camp. And because the soldiers are not in the camp, there's nobody to protect the families from being stolen when the enemy comes. The enemy always knows when you leave your family uncovered. Okay, okay, hear me this morning. The enemy always knows when you leave your family 
uncovered and he always knows when you leave your family without protection. And here's what he does. He waits and he looks for an opening. He knows when you have not taken the measure to make sure that your family is protected from his hands and from his spirits. You can get so busy doing your work that you forget how to worship. And when you forget how to worship, not talking about sitting in a church building. When you forget how to worship in your house, you minimize the reality of home style warfare. There is warfare that wants to get inside of your house. And if you don't become a prayer warrior inside of your house, praying over your family and laying hands on your family, you might be getting rich, but your house is getting broke. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Let me talk to every man in here. Are y'all with me, men? Let me talk to every man. It is your responsibility to cover your house and to pray for your house. Y'all quiet in here. And if you are single, it becomes your responsibility. If you're a single mother, then it's your responsibility because the enemy sees when you don't cover your family. For many of us, the stuff that we're dealing with in our homes could have been avoided with a stronger prayer life. Tell your neighbor, don't leave your family uncovered. You've got to keep your family covered. Keep them covered in prayer. Teach them how to pray. Your children need to know how to pray. Your children need to know how to call on the name of the Lord. Your, your children need to know no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Your children need to be sensitive enough to know who to deal with and who to leave alone. How to pray over peer pressure. Your children need to know how to cut some folk off in their lives. How not to watch everything that comes on the TV. They're so busy watching Rich Homie Kwan, Nicki Minaj, and Drake, and everybody else. That now their morals and their lifestyle are unrecognizable to what it means to truly be a child of God. When the child walks around disrespectful. When the child walks around cussing and messing up, it is because somewhere along the way, we did not cover our house. Cover your family. Make sure that they're in church. Make sure they have their own copy of God's word. If, if you're married, let your spouse know that you're praying for them. If you're single, pray in your house before you leave home every single day. Don't let the wrong spirit creep inside of your house. Okay, let me say it like this. Everybody can't come in your house. Everybody don't need to be on your phone. Cover your house. The enemy knows when the soldiers are not there. All the men are gone. Amen. The enemy knows houses that he can get in. Okay, y'all don't y'all think I'm making it up. I'll prove it to you. Job chapter one. Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Satan says, I have, but but you got a hedge around him. And as long as as the hedge is around him, then I can't get in. Okay, how do you know 
that there's a hedge. The only way I know that there's a hedge is because I've been trying my best to get inside of your house. And as long as the hedge is there, I can't get in. You get a hedge when you have a strong prayer life. You get a hedge when you're mature in your walk with God. You get a hedge when you take your morality serious. Look at somebody and tell them, devil, you can't get in here. You cannot have my family. You cannot have my children. You cannot have my money. You cannot have my peace. Don't leave your family uncovered. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Second thing. Second thing. You can't be there for others until you've been there for yourself. Okay. Look, look, at, look at the text. Look at the text. Verse 4. Text says, so the people that were with him. With him in the Hebrew means those who have been on his side. So the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power. Look at verse 6. And David was greatly distressed. Drama. Because the same people who were with him now talked about killing him. Okay. You can go through seasons in your family where folk will switch out on you. You can have folk in your family, your brothers or your sisters. I I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with this. Your son or your daughters or your cousins or whoever, you can have folk in your family that flip that switch on you. And right here, they are mad with David. Here's the trip. Here's, here's the part that got me. They're mad with David like it's all his fault when all of them left their families uncovered too. Y'all seeing this? They were with David, yet they, okay, they treat David. Okay, here it is. Most people don't know how to accept their part. Y'all didn't see me coming. So instead of being mature enough to accept their part and to grow from it, they would rather nurse it and be the victim. I don't know why my family won't talk to me anymore. I don't know why my family won't speak to me. I don't need them anyway. I got friends. Instead of admitting the fact that we play a part in this. So what do they do? They put all of this on David. His family. His family is messed up too. His life is falling apart too. And everybody's turning on him instead of turning to him. The people he should be able to trust are now the people he's got to watch carefully. I'm going to help you with this. It's right here in this text. The text says in verse 4, that the people wept until they had no more power to weep. And then, then verse 6, this is going to help somebody with some of those cantankerous family members you got. Amen, somebody. And it might help you with you. Watch, watch this verse. Verse 6. Verse 6, they spoke of stoning him. Here it is. Not necessarily because they're mad at him, but because their soul was grieved. You, you didn't get it. They speak of stoning David 
not because they're mad with David, but because they're mad at the situation. Here it is. Anger has to have a target. Most people in your family who keep up drama with you, or it may be you keeping up drama with them. It's nine times out of ten, not even about the person that you're throwing the stone at. When you are hurting, you hurt. Okay, hurt people hurt people. Look at, this, look at the text. Their soul was grieved. Their spirit was vexed. So that means another spirit was in operation of their bodies. Here's what we do. We get mad with family or spouses and we call them the devil. Let me help you with this. The only spirit that became flesh was God. The only spirit, the only human flesh is God. The devil did not become flesh. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So if we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, then don't call flesh and blood the devil. It's the devil at work in a spirit inside of their bodies. So now, so now I approach my family. Now I approach my wife. Now I approach my husband or my children or my siblings. I approach them differently if I'm spiritual. Ooh, y'all quiet. I don't disown them. I pray against the spirit that is at work inside of them. I pray against the spirit that is trying to destroy them. So watch, watch David. David, yes, uh, everybody, everybody is against me. My family's gone too. But everybody's against me. So here's, here's what David did. While they yelled at him, he talked to himself. Okay. It says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. You, you've got to understand the Hebrew language to really get this. You've got to understand the Hebrew language. They're yelling at him. You no good so and so. You ain't nothing but a so-and-so. We gonna kill your so-and-so. Y'all not with me this morning. They're yelling all of these things at him. But David talked to himself. Here's what, here's what the Hebrew means. He made what he was saying to himself louder than what they were saying about him. He drowned out the noise of their negativity by turning up the volume of his own voice as he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That, that word encouraged is the same word, the same root word, strength. So here it is. David just started reminding himself of who the Lord God is. And when he started reminding himself of who the Lord God is, it gave him the strength to get himself together. All right, let me say it like this. When your family is falling apart, and your children are straying away. 
and your spouse is acting crazy just look straight ahead don't look at your spouse but she's acting or he's acting crazy and your family is disconnected you don't have time to be throwing pity parties in your life you better remind yourself of who the Lord your God is get yourself together pick yourself up and fix your family you don't have time to play the blame game talk to God strengthen yourself and get yourself together and get your family back you've got to get yourself together before you can get your family together I'm almost done he he got himself together spiritually because what what infiltrated was demonic so you got to fight it spiritually that's why you ought to be in Bible study that's why you ought to be in church and you ought to have personal devotion time if you're married you and your spouse need to be in church your child got a job great hercules hercules they still need to be in church it's a spiritual thing and we've got to get ourselves together spiritually because we can't even pray for our families if we are spiritually immature if you're spiritually malnourished if you don't know the word of the Lord for yourself around here watching Dr. Phil that ain't that ain't where your help comes from our help comes from the Lord we've got to be spiritual and mature before we are ready to handle our homes. Here's the last thing. You can't fight practically until you are fit spiritually. This is going to be so good. This, this is going to be better than the young and the restless. All right, watch this. Watch the text. David does two things. You got your Bible? Text says he called for the priest. This is very important in verse 7. The wording. Bring the ephod here to me. Very important. I need you to hear me. So the first thing David does is he calls for the ephod. Now, let me, let me give a little background on what the ephod is. The ephod was a priestly garment that was worn only by the priest. And the reason why the priest would wear it was because he wanted, it was how God gave the vision to the priest. So whenever the priest would put on this particular garment, God would speak to him by the way of using this thing called the ephod. So what David does is David says, everybody's talking about me. Everybody's messing with me. Everybody's blaming me and accusing me. So he says, here's what I need you to do. Abiathar, bring me the ephod. Hold up. David, you are not the priest. But sometimes things can get so bad inside of your life that you don't have time to wait on somebody else to do the praying on your behalf. Sometimes things can get so messed up inside of your life that you don't have time to wait to get to a counseling service, to wait to get to a church service. Sometimes I've got to be the priest inside of my own life because if I wait another day, my marriage may not make it to next Sunday. If I wait another day, my child may not make it another Sunday. If I wait another day, my health may not make it another Sunday. So even though I'm not the priest, I know how to pray. 
and I'll be the priest inside of my life and I'll pray for myself because I can talk to God all by myself. And somebody needs to hear this. Don't you wait to get to a particular place to learn how to talk to your God. Don't you wait until you get into an organized spot to learn how to talk to God. Sometimes you got to drop right where you are and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help. No other help. So I might not be the priest. I might not, that might not be my calling. But Abiathar, I'm going to pray for myself. And let me show you this. Y'all got time for this? Let me show you one more thing. Last thing. Watch what happens. After he prays, you can read down a little bit further. It says that 600 men come down and they, they do something and then it's left with 200 men and, and they find, they run into a little boy and they take him. He takes them to the Amalekite. All of that, so you can read all of that in the Word. But here's what I want you to see. All I'm trying to get you to see is after he prayed, God gave him a plan. Y'all missed it. After he prayed, God gave him the plan. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what you're struggling with. But God's got a plan. When you learn how to pray, you learn how to talk to God for yourself. You learn how to lift yourself up in prayer. God's got a plan. Stop putting your faith in people. Okay. People will hail you today and nail you tomorrow. So don't put your faith in people. But you put your faith in God. And when you pray... I might not be the priest. I ain't even got an ephod. But God has shown enough. Give me the plan. God bless you. God bless you. If you're here, if you're here this morning, you're here this morning, maybe you've been, you've been dealing with some demonic situations in your life. You've been dealing with family that, that is torn apart by Silly pettiness and jealousy and, and when, you, when you ask why y'all mad at each other, you can't even say why. Give me your hand. Give God your heart. Let us pray for you today so that you'll be spiritually fit to face whatever demons come your way. Because I guarantee you, you'll face demons when you get home you'll face demons when you go to your job and y'all might not invite me back but you'll face demons when you walk into a church building so if you don't learn how to stay prayed up and learn how to strengthen yourself then you'll find yourself going down and down and down but learn how to pray and once you pray God, just like David, will give you your plan. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. If you're here today, you're not a member of the body of Christ, hear the word of God, Romans 10 and 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Believe what you've heard, Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seeks him. Repent of your past sins, Luke 13, verse number 3. I tell you, nay, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Confess that Jesus Christ not was but is the Son of God. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. Him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven, and be buried in the watery grave for the remission 
of your sin. Galatians 3, 26, 27. For as many of you that have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. If you are a member, and you've simply strayed. You've let the Amalekites come into your house and wreck your family. Give me your hand. Give God your heart. And let us pray for you this morning. So that way, whatever was stolen from you, whatever was taken from you, God can restore and help you get it all back and get back better than what you ever even had. But you have to believe it. You have to trust him. And you have to want it. Let's all sing the song of invitation. Prodigal son, I'm on my way back home. Well, and I'm down on my bending knee, begging you to save this soul. I'm